Good evening. Good evening. Hi, welcome to Center for well, the Center the for Strategic, Strategic and International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz, our we Vice President for External Relations. Uh, thank you for coming out on uh, this e this beautiful evening in Washington. Uh, we have <laughs> we we have uh, a terrific panel here today, and in just a minute, thank I'm going to uh, throw this to uh, our colleague Bob Schieffer. But first, I want to say thank you to um, United Technologies, and Greg Ward is here from United Technologies, and I'd like to thank Greg uh, specifically for everything uh, and being our great sponsor and allowing us to do this series. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Texas Christian University and specifically the Schieffer School of Journalism. Uh, I don't know how many of you are baseball fans, but uh, TCU's in the College World Series tonight and it's a must-win game, so we're all, we're all pulling for the frogs tonight. Um, this is a great panel, a uh, very timely issue, uh, and with that I'll send it over to Bob Schieffer. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me because when I was a young reporter, my first assignment uh, in Washington uh, was uh, to cover the Pentagon. And uh, the first Secretary of Defense I covered was uh, Mel Laird, and then uh, Elliot Richardson came for about two months, and then he went on uh, to commerce or someplace. And then along came uh, James Schlesinger, and uh, we became uh, good friends, and it was really fun. I learned a lot uh, in those uh, two years that uh, I covered the Pentagon when you were there, Dr. Lesnar, so it's <laughs> nice to be back again. Uh, he was also our first uh, Secretary of Energy. He took the oath one day after uh, President Jimmy Carter signed the legislation creating the apartment, served in that position from August 1977 to 1979. Uh, in the previous uh, year, the president-elect uh, had asked Dr. Schlesinger to become assistant to the president, charged with the responsibility of drafting a plan for the establishment of the Department of Energy and a national uh, energy policy. And he's gone on to have a distinguished uh, career both in and out of government. Since then, Phil Sharp became the uh, president of Resources for the Future on September 1, 2005. Uh, his career in uh, public service includes 10 terms as a member of the House of Representatives uh, from Indiana and a uh, lengthy uh, tenure on the faculty of the John F. Kennedy School of Government in the Institute of Politics uh, at Harvard. Uh, Frank Verastro, say, say your name. Verastro. Verastro. I, I apologize. That's better. Uh, he is the uh, Senior Vice President and Director of the uh, Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS, has uh, extensive energy experience. He spent uh, 30 years in energy policy and project management uh, positions in the U.S. government and in the uh, private uh, sector. Uh, government service includes staff positions uh, at the White House on energy policy and planning staff and at the Departments of the Interior. Uh, and also at the uh, Energy uh, Department. And then uh, Steve uh, Muffson is the uh, Washington Post's uh, energy correspondent, worked at the Post for 19 years, including uh, as deputy editor of the Post's uh, Outlook section for three years, been the Post's chief economics correspondent, uh, its Beijing uh, bureau chief, and diplomatic correspondent. Before that, he worked at the Wall Street Journal, uh, he has been a, a contributor to various publications, uh, including the New Republic, Washington Monthly, Foreign Affairs, and the Village Voice. Steve, I want to just start with you because <clears throat> we all looked on the television sets today and uh, the picture looked different. All of a sudden it looked like a volcano down there at the bottom of the ocean. What, what happened? It's, uh, it's quite, a, quite, a, quite a gusher. But what happened was that they uh, noticed some fluids coming up one of the pipes that weren't supposed to be there. They took a closer look, decided that one of the remotely operated vehicles, these uh, subsea uh, machines that, uh, that are looking around and doing all the tasks down there, that had it bumped into one of the pipes. And they, they moved the, the pipe that was catching the oil and gas coming up, and uh, they moved that off the well. And so what you're seeing is the full flow of that well coming up into the ocean now. So it's now just going at full strength again. It is. Did they, is there any idea when they're going to be able to bring it back to at least to where it was before they? Uh, I think they may be trying something later today. Even uh, if you look at the uh, video from the BOP site, you can see that uh, there, there are pictures of the containment uh, pipe. And uh, it looks like they're moving it back in that direction. But how long it'll be, I'm not really sure. Another 
<clears throat> another episode of errorless baseball. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Schlesinger, uh, we do reserve the right here at, the, uh, at these symposiums that no matter what the subject, if there's a big news story and there's somebody that might have some <laughs> idea about it, that we, we always ask them. So I, I guess I've got to ask you before we get to anything else, uh, what about the uh, dismissal of uh, General McChrystal today and uh, bringing on uh, General Petraeus? It's all a cover to take attention away from the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Do you, would you have done that had you been Secretary of Defense? Or uh, mean, our president? Pre the president had to do this. Yes. I mean, that's, uh, unlike Harry Truman, he didn't have to fly to Wake Island to, to dismiss <laughs> MacArthur. But you think you think it had to be done? Uh, it would have been. It would have shown great weakness if he failed to do so. You can't. This was insubordination. Whether deliberate or not is another question. MacArthur's case, it was deliberate. All right. Well, let's let's get back to what we all came here for then. Uh, <laughs> the new story. Today. If you were the Secretary of Energy today, what would be your advice to the uh, White House about what to do about this? And, and I'm talking about the, this this situation in the Gulf. And what is government's role? We have a regulatory mechanism. The problem for BP was its failure to follow a checklist. You've got to go down that list, and it was human error just as it was in the Three Mile Island episode. Uh, unfortunately, this was not as well handled politically uh, as the Three Mile Island episode, which in which Governor Thorn, uh, Thornburg uh, very carefully uh, discouraged the Washington community from getting too involved, and that meant that he just ignored the uh, uh, the suggestion from Washington that the whole damn community around Three Mile Island be evacuated. All right, Phil. What would you tell the president right now? Well, looking forward, I think there are several things that they might be doing with industry, and it probably will have legislation to back it up. Uh, and that is, uh, for the future, finding a better technique for industry cooperation in terms of both prevention and in terms of cleanup. Out of the uh, Exxon Valdez, there was a system that grew up of uh, a modest system which now is being used, the booms are in place and those kind of things because there was a collective uh, industry action required at that time. Uh, it obviously is insufficient uh, to the task. That could be upgraded. But if you look at what uh, happened after Three Mile Island, we had the creation of something called INPO, which is a self-regulator, and admittedly that was an easier industry to do that with than the competitive oil industry. But there's some lessons that we could take from that and we could clearly uh, do. Uh, one of those is, is making sure the expertise is available instantaneously uh, from other companies. Uh, on this score, and as I, all we have at this point is scuttlebutt, but uh, certainly uh, some of the things we've heard is that, in fact, they did bring in, or tried to bring in people from other companies, but the lawyers were right in there with them, and the lawyers said, whoa, don't you give any advice unless we're cleared of any liability for what happens if you take our advice. Uh, and so there was at minimum delay, if not lost uh, uh, opportunity in some cases. One story has it that it took three days and the, the expert went back to his company and said, I give up. I'm not even going to mess with it. Now, I don't know what the truth of that is, but, the, but it shows you a problem that needs to be uh, solved. That have to the third part of coordination is something that happens if today in a nuclear power plant, a plant has trouble with a valve, not necessarily a big deal, has trouble with a valve, it will have by email a very short order. Who else in the industry has that valve? Who owns, uh, who uh, repairs that valve? If they have any trouble with that valve, they can know that within minutes from other uh, members of the companies. That, I dare say, is not happening uh, uh, in this instance. And part of that, I suspect, is intensely competitive. Now, I don't know how much cooperation does go on, so there may be more uh, that I'm aware of. But we certainly could get a formal thing to help do that. And obviously, uh, given the massive cleanup, there needs to be an incredibly coordinated advanced preparation on that score. Three Mile Island killed nuclear power for 30 years. And what this will do will be to reduce 
the domestic supply of oil for the foreseeable future, which means higher import bills and higher imports. Well, well, the part we don't know, Jim, is what it's going to do to other governments and other political movements elsewhere in the world, uh, in which some of them are clearly going to look at how far they're willing to go. I have no doubt drilling is going to continue both in this country and abroad. But the question is, is at what additional cost and what additional delay uh, is going to happen elsewhere, because other governments are going to be under pressure to say, oh, wait a minute, are you going to do that here in the Amazon? Uh, Frank. What would be your advice? Well, I would right echo now. Phil's sentiments to start with, but I, I think that one of the problems with the administration coming in was demonizing industry, right? And, and the U.S. government doesn't have the capability to cap a well. So when Secretary Salazar said, well, if this isn't done tomorrow, we're going to do it, um, Commander Allen said, we can't. I was surprised that the uh, president actually took on the notion of capping the well when his real Katrina is clean up. And, and containment at that point, right? So that's the responsibility of the U.S. government. I do think this collaboration is occurring a little bit. I, I know the service companies and a lot of the other majors are on site right. and providing expertise. Um, I think the administration understands the loss of production from the Gulf and actually tanker accidents uh, are responsible for more spills than production platform accidents. But the question is, how do you walk back from it in a responsible manner? Uh, well, this, this latest uh, thing that's happened here. I mean, what what does this mean? I mean, how significant is this? Well, by itself, it's not significant, but I think it's just a sign that the situation is not under control. There's a long way to go here. I mean, one of the big unknowns is uh, the, the weather. A hurricane comes through, and they're going to have to evacuate all these platforms and all these ships that are trying to contain this uh, this damaged well. That could mean stopping operations for anywhere from three to seven days. And during that entire time, they're going to have to disconnect the pipe that's attached to the containment pipe, and the oil will be flowing freely into the Gulf during that time period. So if we have a, you know, a, f a few hurricanes or even hurricane warnings, there's going to be a, a lot more oil in the Gulf and uh, you know, more delay in, in before getting this under control. What? Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say also, we're all assuming at the moment, another one of those big assumptions, that those relief wells are going to be able to pinpoint and hit the right spot to cure this. Now, this industry is highly skilled, and, and they may well do it, uh, but nobody should s uh, assume that's just a home run uh, that is automatic. We're just, everybody's just sort of built that into their thinking well, that it meant the well gets there, we got it. it. It seems pretty likely, but it's not necessarily something you do in the first try. I mean, right. in, in, yeah. the, uh, in the well that had a similar problem off the uh, coast of Australia in the Timor Sea, I believe it took them five, five right. tries. Because what you're looking at is, while but, it's an 18,000 foot column, you're aiming at a diameter the size of a dinner plate. So the relief well, the success rate in the industry is 100%. We always get them. But the question is how long and how many times you have to go there. back to do it. Is there any way to s give an estimate of, of how this thing's going? I mean, we now told that it might be ahead <laughs> of schedule, but then this thing happened today. So the danger always in um, on the relief wells is the early drilling is actually pretty easy. So the first relief well is down to about 16,000 feet. They're looking at what they call a bottom kill to actually get close to the reservoir, pump in drilling fluids, and stop the flow at that point. And then what's ever in the riser will then be suctioned off and that production will come up and then they can cap the main well. The reason we have two relief wells going is to the extent that you run into the same problems running through horizons or a gas burp um, with the relief well that you had in the original well, it's probably prudent to have a second well. It's just, it's a time issue. And I go back to Phil's point, I, I think where the industry is right on prevention, drilling has just been terrific. I mean, we can drill down six miles from where we're sitting with a home computer and hit a spot underneath the Capitol and come within 36 inches of where we want to be. But containment policy is back in the 1980s, in part because we were so confident that blowout preventers work. Well, uh, just well, and in part because there's no money in, in doing spill control. Well, it's I mean, there's, there's yeah. big reservoirs to discover by making advances in drilling. There's, it's a dirty, thankless business cleaning up. Uh, some people would would uh, make the argument, and it's been made, it's not an original thought with me, that we, if a well, if we can't cap a well, if it's too deep to cap, then maybe we shouldn't have drilled it in the first place. 
What yeah, so if you go back to the technology side. Um, the ability of capping, there's, there's, two or th there's a number of fallbacks, and there's redundancies built into the system. The reason that oil and gas came up the pipe, and that's the one thing we're sure of that happened because pressure coming out of the reservoir on the deep water horizon is that, number one, the first fail-safe is the drill mud. That keeps the pressure in the pipe to keep the upflow from coming up. The second is the casing around the pipe, and that's the cement job. And then the third is the blowout preventer. So we haven't seen accidents of this magnitude. I think Steve's absolutely right. It's a question of risk, right? If, you, if none of this happens, we didn't have double hull tankers until the Valdez. I'm sure the technology will emerge, but the drill <coughs> the relief well can't be the solution because it takes three months to drill it. Dr. Schlesinger, was the uh, president right to order a moratorium on, on drilling in the Gulf now? No, it's not due process of law. I mean, we, we now know that a federal judge has overturned uh, that ruling. At and At least now temporarily. Being yeah. We will, we will see an effort by the administration Why is that not to overcome a good, it. A good thing to do. Hmm? Why is it not a good thing to put uh, a moratorium on drilling? Uh, because it follows from your previous question about since we discovered this risk, why uh, would it be a good idea to do any more drilling? The answer is uh, that we will have greater imports and it will be more costly in terms of the balance of trade. Uh, the, the reality is that there's good news here. This may kill off the fantasy of energy independence, which we hear <laughs> uh, regularly from the various political quarters. Well, anybody down there uh, will tell you that the problem is you're putting all these people out of work. Right. And I guess, I guess Congressman well, Gal has said, well, let's just have a partial program. Let's continue drilling, but stop before we get to the place where the oil is. Well, of course, I mean, we have to distinguish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that'll help. <laughs> the, uh, that sounds like a congressional solution. Um, the, uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, he makes it a very, he very seriously has made that. No, I know, I know. He's saying you can drill so far. Yeah. But obviously, he means for a temporary period of time. I mean, I think the real, the tougher thing, which I don't have a handle on, and I'm not sure whether, uh, uh, who has a handle on this, is how weak is the regulatory system and the regular oversight been? And uh, even though I know there have been efforts to go in and, and take a quick look and see if, if it and the performance is likely to be there, because I can assure you we'll all talk differently next week if there's another well <laughs> that goes. And of course, everybody said, now, well, that won't happen. Uh, well, that's what they all said before. So I don't know what the answer is. I mean, because I think, I think we do not, we cannot afford to shut off all drilling. We cannot afford, unless we're ready to just throw in the towel and, and let the prices rise extremely. But the welling that's been restricted is in the deep well water area. Now, that's very lucrative oil. That's where the big stuff is. And we clearly have had wells successfully drilled there. So it's not brand new. It's not either or. Uh, the question is whether there's a reasonable justification for a temporary to get the regulatory system in order and to make sure the industry, uh, the various drillers, have their act in order. And I'm not willing to certify that, that I know that's the case. <laughs> I mean, I think in, the, on, in defense of the, of the administration, I mean, we do, the judge asked, you know, you don't necessarily shut off all tanking biz, tanker business or ground all airplanes every time there's an accident. But in fact, when there is an airplane accident, you do sometimes ground yeah. planes that are a similar type. So it's not a completely crazy idea. But, um, but they haven't actually uh, haven't determined which wells are the same type right. or not. And so I think that's where the judge found some fault, six months, I don't know whether it'll be done in more than six months, less than six months. I mean, that, the time period is, is kind of a political pause, gets them past the elections. It shows that they're thinking it over. So, you know, there, there's some weakness in the Interior Department argument there. But ultimately, we have to go back to the deep water because, as you say, that's where the best prospects are. The, the on-land United States is kind of like a pincushion after over 100 years of drilling. Two-thirds of Exxon's Exploration acreage is in deep water, whether it's in the Gulf of Mexico or other places around the world. An increasing portion of our domestic uh, oil supplies come not only from the Gulf, but from the deep water portion of the Gulf. 30% of our supplies are from the Gulf, and 26% uh, of those Gulf supplies are from deep water. And those numbers are growing bigger and bigger. So sooner or later, we're going to be back there, I think. The question is, how long will it take? How much more cost there will be? What can we really come up with some uh, guidelines to make this safer? 
What the judge said was that the Department of the Interior had misrepresented deliberately the judgment of the experts from the National Academy of Engineering who never recommended okay. the yeah. um, So they're redoing their case now. They're going back in and trying yeah. to, yeah. to re, um, re, re... You know, a BP has said from the beginning that the oil is on top, that it's on top. But uh, our reporting, just at CBS and other people, suggests that maybe there's more oil down below. Uh, Tell us about that. Who, who can talk about that? Yeah, I think and what two, do you make of these reports? Well, two things are happening. One is the water depth, right? So we're in a mile deep just water to where the wellhead is on the surface on the seabed. So this notion that oil is lighter than water, it always comes to the top, I think that was prevailing wisdom. When you've got currents, uh, ocean currents, and you've used dispersants, you can actually lose some of the oil in the space between the seabed floor and the surface. And this idea of plumes or clouds, <coughs> we need to do uh, more examination of what actually happens in this environment. That I don't think the industry. Well, also, uh, there's a, been a, we think there's been a trade off between our capacity to scoop the oil up <laughs> and the dispersant. Right. Uh, there were different strategies which, on a smaller scale, might have made sense. The question is when you get to this scale, would we have been better off not to disperse? I don't know the answer to that. That's the kind of thing that, out of this, we should learn and get clarity on strategy. Uh, for these kind of things. I mean, I think the idea of the dispersant was that you increase the surface area of the, of the oil and it helps uh, right. speed up the awesome. natural breakdown right. that uh, bacteria do in the water. The danger is that, you know, has the dispersant somehow made the oil heavier? And also, if you're trying to skim or burn oil, it's better to actually have it in a concentrated yeah. place. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if 20 years from now we treat oil spills with coagulants to keep it in a tight space that we've come up with a better way to, to scoop up. So, I mean, I think this whole issue of the dispersant is going to be um, the source of a lot of debate uh, as time goes on. Well, and of course, it's an, it helps the company because it's less visible. Yeah. And, you know, so from an image po and the government, from an image the, point of view, it looks a little better. Fewer dead birds, but maybe more dead turtles. It goes back to the issue of containment being kind of stuck in the 1980s. Yeah. So if you think about, um, a snowblower on your driveway, right? So it works really well when there's two inches of snow. It doesn't work so well when there's a sheen or the equivalent of, of just a, a small thing. And so the skimmers, which is a technology that we've used before, but on sheens aren't particularly effective, especially when there's waves and high wind. Do you, have you seen any, anything that would suggest that there's been a breach in the well? In other words, that all of the oil is not just coming out of this uh, wellhead, but coming out of the floor of the ocean and other places? So there's natural seeps that occur right. everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, and oil and gas all the time come through the seeps in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, I think <coughs> some people have mistaken, I don't know exactly the answer to this, but some people have mistaken these little plumes that show up on the seabed floor. The explanation so far has been that when the remotely operated vehicles move, they kick up dust. And that what you're actually seeing is, is the dust in the back. But again, this is a mile deep, so not clear how this is working. I think we'll have some uh, questions from uh, the audience, and we'd like to entertain those. Uh, while we're uh, waiting for those, uh, let me just uh, go through a couple other questions. And I think we've touched on this, but let's, let's talk about it some more, Dr. Schlesinger. How is this going to affect the U.S. oil supply through this year and next year? Are consumers going to see changes in prices at the pump because of this? Uh, they're not likely to see changes in the price at, at the pump because we will be importing more oil. And uh, I suspect that the Saudis will loosen up, or the OPEC will loosen up. Uh, it will, of course, affect uh, our ability to produce crude. The longer that the moratorium lasts, the greater will be the reduction of future supply, and the greater will be our level of imports, and the greater will be our outpayments and the balance of payments. The, the, the assumption that the Secretary has been underlying here it's unbelievably missed in this country by so many people is how much we are part of this international global oil market. And so one of the reasons is that at the moment with recession around the world, the pressures on the world oil market are not great and the prices have been coming down and we're lucky these, these events act in that way come together in terms of price. And so we're not gonna pay the price, but it sort of shifts where oil is coming from, who's producing it, who's making the money out of it. Uh, and over time, uh, that, that market will tighten back up, uh, we assume, with, uh, with that. 
but, but it's this notion of we so casually talk about it as if it's the American oil, and, and it is an international pool of oil, and it makes it very difficult for public policy, and it makes it very difficult to do. And well, anyway, if, I, if, I won't if, preach more. <laughs> if we had to have an oil spill, it was optimally timed. Oh, that's nice. right. That's right. It's important That's to right. distinguish those. If so that happened three years, two years ago when the oil prices were way up, whoa, yeah. this thing would have been. The 33 wells that have been suspended were exploratory wells. So That's the right. amount of production they were going to deliver between now and the end of the year yes. is kind of minimal. Right. So you just push that forward. I think the real concern is that if this extends to next year. If the commission rules or makes a determination in January, and then that results in the promulgation of new regulations, and this really looks more like a year, that you see rigs deploying from the Gulf, going elsewhere, and then you actually lose production in the United States, and just what Jim was talking about, you supplant it with inputs. Tony Hayward actually put a number on it in a conference call recently that the BP alone would be down about 50,000 barrels, I think, in 2011, and maybe 70,000 in 2012, 70, 75,000 barrels a day. I think one thing we So it's just pretty substantial for one It's hard for us to figure. Is we, we've been talking about what government does to industry here, and it certainly can do things. Uh, but what we don't know is this industry decisions that result from this. This is a new high-risk proposition, and you can imagine what's going to go on in boardrooms and in, in uh, decisions about where to invest their money and who to bank on and who to contract with to do the work for them and whether they trust uh, which drillers and all that kind of stuff. That's going to be scrutinized in industry more and more. Now, I don't, that again, I don't think it's going to fundamentally reshape the oil market, but it may mean that there is a greater risk, less risk-taking, and therefore we'll begin to see the production uh, It's all, more also developed. going to rebound on the uh, degree that w industry is willing to bid. That's right. And uh, thus the taxpayers the will be paying for a good chunk of this. Do you think we're not going to see any drilling uh, in the Gulf for a long, long time, or do you think... Uh, when do you think it will start back? Well, I think you're going to see drilling go forward in the, in the shallow area, period, now. <laughs> uh, there was some scrambling right. going on as to whether the, what the rules are going to be and that kind of stuff. But that's going to go forward, I think, in the deep well. And I think we'll be back to deep wells. I just don't know how quickly. What yeah, do you I, think, I think we'll get back there. I mean, and I think the administration has been careful not to promise too much in the way of a moratorium. I mean, Salazar has described it as a pause, not a halt. So I think that they are, they're leaving themselves open, the path open, to get back to it relatively soon. Yeah, but not before Election Day. Not before Election Day. Yeah, There'll I, be no drilling <laughs> before Election Day. I That's don't right. think so. That, that Just the coincidence, though, I think, yeah. that the six-month <laughs> time period corresponds. Yeah, so on the issue of the deep water exploration, I think that's actually right. And, but I do think that they're going to look for ways to try to ease up on, on the restrictions so that we don't see this massive redeployment. Because once that's gone, once these rigs go overseas, it'll be a year before they come back. What I, I'd like the panel's just thoughts on how BP has handled this. I mean, obviously they, you know, they're getting hammered, and uh, uh, they, do you think they've been unfairly treated, Steve? Well, yes, <laughs> yes, and no. I mean, it's hard to to come off well when you've had a disaster like this. Um, some things I think have been unfair and, and some, things, some things not. I mean, I think from the, the documents and testimony we've seen so far, there, it's, there definitely seems to be a lot of fault on the part of BP and the BP operators. And, you, and you've got to wonder, you know, how in a big organization like BP, which has already had a history of safety problems, you know, that is somewhat old, um, how, a, how a chief executive can make sure those things don't happen again and, and wonder whether or not Tony Hayward did enough. Uh, on the other hand, some part of you has to feel a little bit for Tony Hayward. He's, you know, had just turned in a great quarter. You know, he's got his mind on a lot of other things. He's having breakfast in London one day, and, you know, one, you know the phone rings, and that's pretty much the end of his career as he knew it. And, but, uh, you know, in the context of the catastrophe in the Gulf, that seems like a small thing, and people here are very angry, and I think that's understandable. And those high compensation packages account for this kind of risk. They, yeah, I mean, you know, say he's, your career may be over, but you, uh, you can get back to another life. I mean, he uh, did, not going he to did be like the I would say, the, on the positive the side, he came mm -hmm. here, he's been here nonstop, 
they haven't said no about spending anything with the right. exception of one thing which they didn't even quite say no to in the end. Uh, on the other hand, you know, he's, he's made some very <coughs> ill-considered remarks and, after, and the, the, test, the day of testimony in Congress I thought was catastrophic for him to sit there and say he has no opinion at all about uh, all the documentation and testimony that comes come out, I think was uh, stretched a lot of people's credulity and got a lot of congressmen upset. And then he goes home and goes on the, the yacht, which on the one hand, obviously, he must have felt like he needed to get away <laughs> from everything. But it, you know, the image is very bad. So he does bear some Well, I mean, there's no question that their public relations has just been a total uh, disaster, but well, I think it couple. could have actually been worse, uh, believe it or not. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I thought it could have been a lot worse. Say it could have rained, you know. I mean, I've, are, are you asking whether this was a shakedown? Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> well, the, the fact is that it was an indiscreet comment by Congressman uh, Barton. Texans do that, by the way. <laughs> 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 that the the reality is that you can be indiscreet, but it can be at least partially true. And uh, arm twisting might have been a more appropriate uh, term. But uh, I doubt that the B uh, BP board sat around and said, we are very eager to borrow $10 billion from the banks and ten sell $10 billion worth of bonds and to cut the dividend. And uh, it required considerable pressure from the administration. Uh, you can call it a shakedown, you can call it uh, arm twisting, but it was uh, certainly not a voluntary action on their part. But this is not a typical accident, right? right? I mean, this this is way beyond BP and what it affects in the Gulf, what it affects in the industry, what it affects in terms of the international oil companies. An increasing amount, as Steve said, of their, their international production now because they don't get access to conventional stuff on shore in a lot of places is to go in the technically difficult places, in the subsalt, in the, the real deep depths in the deep water. Um, and if they lose that, their ability to do that just concentrates production in a, in a smaller group. This is not good for national security policy as well. Well, I'm not quite as sympathetic uh, <laughs> as Jim is to the voluntary nature of this. American citizens are demanding <laughs> performance of their government and performance of their corporations, and they're not very pleased with either at the moment. And so uh, it, it may turn out that BP finds this actually is to their advantage, not uh, whether the, uh, to have this set up as an independent thing. By the way, so far, they've been paying everything. Every, every claim that has come forth has gotten their money. Now the fear was that that would not, would not continue. People may discover they don't get as easy a payment when they have to produce documents that uh, either government or this third party uh, will will require. So it's not like it's a perfect system. But I, but I do. Th it may it may limit some of the liability over time for BP by having this system set up. But the point is, it, the trouble is we're having great difficulty figuring out in this world society how to keep people accountable, whether it's in government, in big government, or whether it's in big corporations. And so <clears throat> the notion that we're into this negotiation, that we ought to be going by this nice, clean view, well, that's the private sector and this is the public sector, that just doesn't get it anymore. We haven't figured out the rules of the game as to where the pressures ought to be uh, kind of thing. And so. Uh, the, the, the average citizen is not, I think, going to be very sympathetic uh, uh, to that uh, libertarian philosophy in this instance. They like it in lots of other instances, but not in If this public instance. opinion demands a shakedown, you don't call it a shakedown, right? <laughs> well, that's right. But also, <laughs> excuse me, the apology? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, not if I've lost my business in the Gulf, not if I've lost everything in my life that I've worked for in the Gulf, and this is how Washington treats things, excuse me. <laughs> well, I mean, generally speaking, in this country, when you, when you break something you know, uh, and it impacts on the them. community, it's yeah. your responsibility right. to And it is here. And it is here. The problem and is, they're, that, and they're trying is to that the, the legal system, as we see, right. can take a long time. And we just reached the conclusion of the Valdez case 20, 20 years out. And so, you know, a lot of people didn't want to wait that long. You can sympathize with that in a way. But obviously, you know, we still don't know where responsibility lies. So that's, that's the dilemma, right? You want to get money flowing. On the other hand, you don't quite know all the details yet. 
Well, on the other hand, if the U.S. government unilaterally closes down drilling in the Gulf, you don't demand that BP uh, pay lost income for people in the and Gulf. And that was an overstatement. I think people recognize that as an overreach. There's also state governors that came in and said that BP should compensate the states for income tax revenue they lost because people didn't have jobs. And so I, you have to get to what's a legitimate claim. Well, what is the answer to that? Because <laughs> if, uh, if you do have this moratorium, there's going to be an enormous number of people that are going to be put out of work, and not just people who work in the oil industry, but restaurants, I mean, uh, oil well service companies. I mean, it, it just goes on and on and on. And that's where I think that the administration is going to have to find a, a, a middle road to walk on this. There's going to have to be a certain set of standards on the safety side that you can demonstrate that uh, what risk is acceptable. And I think it starts in the shallow water, right? Uh, June 27th, there's a, a notification that went out so that, that you have to comply with certain regulations. And I think increasingly you'll, you'll find that, that you'll use those rigs in work over wells or development wells to kind of keep the people employed until you can make a determination. I think the biggest problem is having set up this presidential commission it's going to be hard to justify going back in the deep water when you don't have a containment policy before the commission rules. So by definition, you're looking at January, February at the earliest and probably something later. And what's, I think that's the concern. What's not clear to me is you said when the commission rules. Well, when the commission uh, makes recommendations. Uh, the administration must keep its authority to itself <laughs> and right. make sure it does not lock itself in, even though the original rhetoric might have, to the notion that somehow it's governed by yeah, whatever the commission uh, decides uh, uh, and when they decide it. They, they have to be willing and gutsy enough and smart enough to say, we're ready to make a decision when we think it's appropriate and not just be... Uh, this is the, not to take it away, but it's good to have a commission right. for some purposes. But that's I don't want to insult your former career, but politicians are not noted for their courage. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I've noticed that. <laughs> Let me ask you about this congressional hearing where you had the other oil companies that were, were called up there before that congressional uh, committee. And they went over the the plans that they had in case there was an accident. And it seemed like everybody was working off the same piece of paper. And, and clearly, I mean, from what you found out at that congressional hearing, uh, it was absurd. It was about walruses and, and, and things like that. It was people's names there that you were supposed to get in touch with that had died years ago. Uh, is the industry and, and its plans, is, is it bad? as it seemed at that hearing, or was this just no, a so congressional I, hearing that was It's 40 years for since we had a similar right. spill. 40 years. And what we've seen is a growth of complacency and the carelessness, particularly on the part of BP. Yeah, yeah I think two things happened. I would distinguish the two hearings. So the hearings with the walrus, if I was a company at this point, I would be upset that whoever I subcontracted out to write my environmental impact statement <laughs> wrote the same statement for all the other companies, yeah. right? And that clearly. became boilerplate, clearly. And got um, paid five times. Right. <laughs> no. The American way. Um, in terms of the walrus, though, I, you know, you can spend time on that or you can spend time on solutions. Right, and I would right. distinguish that between um, the Waxman hearing, where I think Congressman Waxman always does his homework. He had a 14-page letter, and what he distinguished with the other companies was in this type of well, with this type of pressure, and these type of horizons, this is standard industry practice. And this is what BP chose to do. And you saw you know, Rex Tillerson and Watson from Chevron and Shell all say, confronted with similar situations, we would have done X. And then I go back to Steve's point. So then when they asked Hayward, well, so why did BP make the decisions you made? His answer after 60 days, so there had to be an internal BP investigation, is I wasn't on the platform. It, people want better accountability. I understand the liability concerns. I understand the attorneys. But people want more uh, straight talk on how this happened. Yeah, I mean, I think where the, the whole industry is at its weakest is that obviously no one had a way of containing a spill right. anywhere near the magnitude that they had all claimed to have been able to contain. And otherwise, we'd have seen it out there. And this is something that can be addressed. I mean, there's no reason why we, that the industry has to be first fabricating the kind of containment pipes or undersea uh, manifolds or all the other stuff that they've been forging in, in plants on the coast and waiting you know, two weeks or more for these things to get done. All that stuff could be sitting there uh, you know, in, in a couple of different locations across the Gulf, and it wouldn't even cost that much money. 
uh, they could share these things. And I think you'll, you're going to see something uh, like that will come out of, of one of these uh, panels. And I think that's, that's going to be one of the changes. You know, we'll I think see. there's a, a tougher endemic problem in us humans. <laughs> and that is simply that if you notice what we've just been through, we have been through on Wall Street where we miscalculated the risk. Very smart people. Some of them may have been highly motivated to make money by miscalculating that risk, but others were not. And the same with government regulators. We, we, we're, we've seen the same thing here as where we get in the mindset. We saw this on the electricity crisis in California. We've seen this happen again and again when the mindset is collective. I mean, all but some outlier, and they, they become famous and rich for uh, two days uh, out of their books. But except for those people, everybody buys into, you know what, we haven't had a spill for 40 years. We have this incredibly sophisticated technology, and it is, uh, for doing this. And so this case is very unlikely to happen. And you get complacent. Should we? Of course not. But the truth is that we do things huge now in, in big ways, and frankly, this is the, the issue about climate change is we're changing the chemistry of the atmosphere and we're changing the chemistry of the ocean because we're doing things huge. How big a risk is that? Well, you can get a debate here about that. But the question is, we're having trouble as a people figuring out when do we do this? Because the truth is, if you want that oil, we're going to take some risks. Let's, let's stop the truth. We can drive all the cars and fly all the planes and do all the stuff that we love to have and all the plastic we, we like to do, it, which we're overloading with plastic now. Uh, and we, we can all turn around and say, oh, we hate these oil companies. We hate everybody in the business. We want to stop them all. Well, you know, that's childish. Questions from out there? Yes, right here. For anybody, does any <laughs> at the end of the day change the trajectory of U.S. energy policy or so-called policy? Does it make a difference anywhere down the line? It's a very good question. Who would like to answer? Well, I mean, I think clearly the administration is going to try to make that come true. That's going to be the positive side of this incredibly negative experience and to try to mobilize people to say, <coughs> if this, you know, this should be a wake-up call. I mean, that's the line that the president keeps using. Uh, personally, though, I'm, I'm kind of, I mean, we'll have to see. Congress hasn't distinguished itself, you know, by moving quickly toward a climate or energy bill. And uh, I'm not sure that this is really going to help. In fact, in some ways, it could make it harder because one of the chips that was being used to help bring some more votes onto a climate bill was offshore dr expansion of offshore drilling. So whether, you know, whether they can get Republican votes without that or whether they're politically able to keep Democratic votes if they move ahead with that, I think is uh, unclear and maybe in some ways harder. I didn't even notice there was a trajectory. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, it's very <coughs> Anybody else want to take a shot at that? Or? I think it's stop-start. I mean, it, it, when I look at Secretary Schlesinger, so in the 70s, we knew all these things, right? That the current system was unsustainable. Um, decontrolled oil, decontrolled gas, moved with clean air, clean water, cafe standards. We even developed in the Carter administration a, uh, the Sinfuels Corporation, which has been much decried. Um, but the idea was to build up a backstop technology for the day when you needed it. And we came in with tax cuts in the early 80s. Congress decided that the conventional prices were low enough. We did away from it. And 30 years later, we're kind of back in the soup. So I mean, I think that the transformation is underway. I think we're going to move towards efficiency and lower carbon alternatives. <clears throat> it should also be a call to us that we need to keep the conventional system robust because it supplies 80% of our, our needs. And it's going to be here for decades. And that's where I think maybe the administration hasn't been honest. So the president's starting to say that it's going to be there for decades. But it took a while for the Secretary of Energy, for example, to acknowledge that we need oil and gas and nuclear <coughs> control. Next question. <laughs> right here. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I have a hard time with an election where you're saying, well, I'm going to Thank you. 
And, and it troubles me with Obama that he seems to have this mindset where those who cause the disaster should be the ones who have the solutions for it. Some of the recommendations after Exxon Valdez were not implemented that put locals in, in a responsibility for coming up with solutions that they would have been able to put forward because of their knowledge of the area. And the locals finally testified before Congress a couple of weeks ago and said 52 days they saw no skimmers. Some of the booms that were out there weren't being cleaned off. Um, they could have used a lot of the fishermen and converted their boats and sent them out. And, and, and the dispersants are extremely troublesome because Europe bans those chemicals. All right. Um, what do you so, like and, and I just wanted to ask one last, to ask someone to address our risk assessment paradigm seemed very flawed. Well, that's what I was trying to get at is the difficulty we have, whether it's government, industry, or, or more collective in the population, coming to, to a, a, a good assessment of risk and what to do. I mean, we all agree that there's been this enormous neglect by government and by this industry in terms of the cleanup uh, things and we, that we should be demanding that. The question is, is how rapidly could we get off oil, which I assume you would like for us to do. I'm guessing that's part of your advocacy. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I would like to and I wish us a whale and I wish we didn't have carbon in it. And, uh, and I think we will move in that trajectory. But anybody who thinks that in a decade we're going to be off this stuff ha must be making some other kind of decision. And by the way, if we're going to do this, well, I'm, excuse me, I'm going to get off on nuclear next. <laughs> but it, 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 it's not a trade-off between oil and nuclear unless you get to electric transportation. But it is if you start talking about the carbon problem. Pardon me, I didn't no, bring more, more issues in. <laughs> Another question? Right well, here. it's a failure. There oh, go is, ahead. Dr. Schlesinger. There has been a failure to crack down on BP. We had the accident in the refinery uh, That's right. down in Texas. Yeah. We had the accidents up in Alaska. Uh, we should have cracked down earlier. Uh, we did impose a substantial fine, but it was inadequate to reshape the BP culture. Well, also, you're talking about different parts of the business, and, and, and nobody was actually looking for the, as a totality. They were looking at their section of the business, refining or, or where the accidents were, and they should have been uh, looking at yeah. Human error can be mitigated, if not prevented, in organizations with the right kind of culture, governance, uh, uh, vigilance, uh, and the like. Apparently, we didn't have that with BP. Uh, to quote a colleague, what we need is less of blowout preventers and more of screw-up preventers. <laughs> but how can you change organizations, and in particular, what is the government role without really intervening in the very structure and function of our businesses. Well, it, it seems to me you're always going to have bad actors somehow. You're not going to change the culture or guarantee the culture of every company out there. And that's what the role of government is supposed to be, is to be able to make sure that people adhere to standards that they might not, to, might not uh, do otherwise. And that's why I think we, this is such an, an incredible story, which is that you've really had multiple failures. You've had right. failures at corporate level, at human level, at regulatory level, and in our whole kind of collective uh, understanding of the trade-offs involved in, in what we do. So, I mean, it's a very deep and broad story. But I would say that that's why you have government. But in, in the nuclear sure industry, in the nuclear industry, they also have this collective effort called INPO that was set up after by the industry. It actually works closely with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is the official government thing. And one of the things that they are looking at in their regular audits of every power plant in this country is that question of safety culture in there. And they rate these, these things, and they bring the CEOs together after they've rated them. And by golly, the other CEOs... <laughs> Uh, I wanted to use some colorful language here. Explain to that CEO, you don't keep your shop in order and we all go down. Uh, and so there are ways to do this. Now, whether you can get that same effective system of INPO uh, in the deep water drilling, I don't know. But we certainly ought to look at it as a possible pattern. The Exxon people said that, they, that we train our people that's right. and they must follow the procedures. 
what is clear in the case of BP is that they fail to follow the accepted procedures and there should be a substantial penalty. And I think the challenge on the industry right now is to go back and look at best practices. So governments can do standards and regulation, but if the industry doesn't come up with what the best approach is, and I do think we will see a marine spill, a collective marine spill uh, capacity developed because it needs to be developed and uh, updated. One of the major companies in a conference I was at recently said they transformed the safety culture within their company, but it took them almost a decade to, to, to make it really effective and to, and to have confidence that it had been. I, I know what the reality is. It took a decade for BP to transform its culture into an environmentally friendly green organization. I don't think it took them a decade. <laughs> the public relations people did that quickly. On this side? <laughs> Are we concerned uh, too much about keeping BP in business, as the president himself <laughs> said? And this would come in the way of making them do what they have been responsible for. Uh, I, I see that there is more concern about keeping them viable and keeping them in business. Well, I don't think there's any evidence that the administration is doing something. They're no, no, no kind of bailout, no kind of this kind of thing. I think they're being hard on him. I mean, in some ways, I think people ought to give this president more credit. He could have been up there lambasting, and that's what a, a lot of his friends on the left were telling him to do, that he should have just been ripping them to shreds every day. And he acknowledged, we got to pay a bill to pay here. We have work to be done, uh, and they've got a responsibility to do it, and we want them to survive it long enough to be able to do that. It's not like he's trying to bail them out or his buddies or anything of the sort. And, and I don't know why we can't take seriously. We, we will not allow uh, today a president or another uh, policy leader to actually have an intelligent statement on something. If they don't run to the right or they don't run to the left, we, we tear them to shreds all day long. And I personally am getting sick of it. <laughs> I think we have to separate a motion, too. I, there was a, a public outcry to, to boycott BP stations, right? So most of the service stations are run by franchisees. They were probably Amico franchisees before this. They're small right. businesses. And, and you're right. We could have had the same thing as we had a run on Enron. So if people dumped the stock or walked away from BP on the financials, their ability to pay would have been adversely affected. Right here. We're getting close to the end here. Frank and I work together on this a little bit, but the amount of uh, oil that lies in the world in deep water is amazing. And I think it's just was a huge find off of Brazil. And also the number of um, deposits which lie on um, lines of uh, dispute between countries is quite, quite large. And I think that there's, there's going to be a tremendous restraint put upon the development of one of the more productive areas of the world, not just in the U.S. I mean, it's, it's That's so what I was thinking at the outset. It's yeah. so likely that they're so obvious, I guess, that CNN uh, and the other American networks concentrate about 99% of their coverage in the Gulf and ignore the fact that the volume of oil, I mean, if you look at a map of the world and it shows you what the potential is for oil underwater at various depths, it, it is staggering. I mean, the, the Gulf of Oil is just a drop compared to what lies elsewhere, and, and how that will play out, both in terms of uh, just the overall production, but also, uh, here in Humber, Frank, the State Department would let, wouldn't let us release the study about the amount of oil lay within disputed areas, uh, because you can imagine if you have a, a field which lies in a disputed area, the environmental arguments will be brought to the forefront very quickly in order to prevent the other side from there's a piece in the G20 communique that's going to come out that, that talks about um, uh, Norway, the UK, Brazil, Australia, uh, maybe West Africa, uh, offshore China. So there's a lot of places and whether or not we can have an international uh, agreement or an assessment of, of how we might approach this differently because it's not just the United States, you're right. Yeah, we don't, we don't uh, that's what I, why we, I think it's very hard for us to predict what's going to happen to oil drilling around the world. I think it will go forward. The question is, will it, will it be constrained in quite a, a way because of other governments and, and, and not to mention the industry itself struggling with risk? As to the Gulf itself, Mexico, Venezuela, 
and now Cuba are going to be drilling in the Gulf, right. and I don't think that they're going to be much inhibited by any regulations that we adopt. Well, I think on that note, we uh, have come to the end of another Schieffer School Symposium. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it.